We have all been very effectively taught as children that there are certain things that nice people don't talk about and surely don't ask. What happens at home stays at home. Well, guess what? That is impossible to do because you carry it with you no matter what. Children who had adverse childhood experiences, it could be abuse, it could be neglect, it could be anything with regard to that was detrimental to the child without a buffer. What we see now is, is there's a whole uh, body of research now that's starting to come out. And it's one of the first times that adverse childhood experiences was connected to dying earlier. The ACE study itself, we had roughly 17 and a half thousand people in the study. And we have thus far been following them forward 19 years in time. A very clearly middle-class group. One conclusion is, my God, if things are this bad in the clearly middle-class group, you know, they surely are not going to get better if you're living on the street or in prison or part of an oppressed minority. We know that by doing therapy or dealing with some of the issues that cause some of that stress, that you can change that and limit the amount of damage that it does to the body. The health-related cost for an individual versus a system are profound. And that's just pure cost. That's not, that's a, the cost right then. That's not the cost of a child experiencing those adverse events and the clinical outcome that we know will play a role for that child's health. When you recognize the statistics about how those adverse childhood experiences show up in some of the healthcare issues that we work with and deal with, you recognize pretty quickly uh, that there's work for us to do here in healthcare. Whole People Childhood Trauma is a TPT Partnerships co-production with Centra Care Health. Normal childhood brain development starts right from the get-go. In a, an ultimate and a wonderful situation, you'd have adult caregivers, it doesn't have to be parents, but adult caregivers who are bonding with that child and making sure that they're, they're that ongoing source of stimulus and also feeding off of anything that a child is offering. It's that serve and volley approach in which a child is seeking guidance and an adult in some way affirms it. And that lays down the brain connections and sets off a pathway that allows for really kids, adults to function as a relationship-based society. About five years ago, one of my colleagues, one of the chaplains in the spiritual care department came to me and she said, Brett, have you ever heard of the ACE study? And of course, at that point, I hadn't. And so she gave me a lot more information so I could become more aware of the ACE study and the impact of the ACE study. And we sort of decided that this was something that the organization needed to um, be embracing more and so brought it to senior administration and you know, started having conversations about what would it take for us to become a trauma-informed organization. And right now we're in a phase uh, within Centric Care that we're just doing a lot of education and information. And so changing that question from um, what's wrong with you to what happened to you. When people have three or more adverse or four or more adverse childhood experiences, there is a likelihood that if that is never mediated, which means that there's never any kind of nurturance or ever, never any kind of reprieve from that, what has a tendency to happen is that those people will also experience social and emotional upheaval. They might experience an adoption of high-risk behavior. All these different types of ways to deal with that trauma. And those people, what the ACE study says is that those people usually on average die earlier. Although the ACE study was primarily done for white people. Adverse childhood experiences or ACE study is an outgrowth of multiple 
unexpected counterintuitive observations that we were making starting at about 1984 or 1985 in a major obesity program that I was putting together in my Department of Preventive Medicine at Kaiser Permanente in San Diego. It was one notable patient, uh, a young woman who showed up in 1985. She was 28 years old, uh, weighed 408 pounds, asked us if we could help her with her problem. And uh, in retrospect, our first mistake was accepting her diagnosis of what the problem was. And so we said yes and entered her into the program and took her from 408 to 132 in 51 weeks. And then in one three-week period, regained 37 pounds, which I had not conceived as being physiologically doable before that. In short order, she's back over 400 pounds, faster than she had lost the weight. And I remember asking her, you know, what's, what's going on? After some trying to escape the question on her part led to her telling me about a lengthy incest history with her grandfather from age 10 to age 21. I remember thinking, my, you know, this is the second incest case I've seen in 23 years of practice at that point. I had always assumed it was quite rare. It's actually fairly common. What's rare is for anyone ever to bring it up and, you know, even rarer for anyone to ask. So that was really sort of the opening wedge uh, into coming to realize that childhood sexual abuse was quite common. And ultimately, these things that we were seeing were so unexpected and so prevalent that people at the CDC convinced me that we really needed to look at a very large sample and from a general population to see whether these things that we were finding so commonly in our obesity program existed in a general population, and if so, how did they play out over time? ACEs on a public health level are those items that we really recognize are the things that drive um, and are linked to, to outcomes of poor health. And so those genes that are more likely to be expressed in a toxic environment may be some of the genes that you don't really want translated. Those are gonna be genes in which you might have more anxiety, you might have more cancer, you might be more at risk for hypertension or depression. And so yes, when we talk about the effects of toxic stress on the individual at that family level, and you could see it generation after generation, there's a lot of science behind why that really is the case. The difference in terms of the way that I look at it is that I also believe that poverty is an adverse childhood experience. I believe that uh, historical trauma is an adverse childhood experience. Intergenerational trauma is an adverse childhood experience. Institutional trauma is an adverse childhood experience. And that couples with people's personal traumas. So a lot of times when we're working with trauma, we're zeroing in on the personal traumas without all of this other stuff that may have proceeded before the child even made it to the earth. There's a study that was done years ago called the Cherry Blossom Study. Cherry Blossom was where they took these male mice and they put them in a cage together and they gave them good food, good water, clean water, run around, all that different type of stuff. After a little while, what the scientists did was start pumping in the smell of cherry blossoms. What the mice didn't know is that on the bottom of the cage, it was electrified. So they would pump in the cherry blossom smell and then at the same time, turn on the electricity. And you can imagine that these mice started to try and protect themselves, crawling all over each other, trying to get out of the cage. So they did that over time. What they noticed is that, number one, the mice never returned to baseline. Nothing like that happened. The other thing that happened is that when they stopped the electricity and then just pumped in the cherry blossom smell, they did the same thing, you know, conditioning. So they took these male mice, 
then put them in a cage with female mice who had never had this experience. They bred, and then just before the female mice had baby mice, they removed the fathers, so they never had any contact with each other. Once the mice got of age, they started pumping in the cherry blossom smell. And what happened was, is these mice started doing the same thing that their fathers did. That's the epigenetic, that's the blood-borne memory. You know, I think epigenetics is the new, new science, and I, I love the fact on how our DNA is only like 2% coded, you know, that's our hair color, our eye color, and you know, the rest is all formed by experiences and by our environment. And, you know, even before we're born in utero and you can uh, be read to, then I'm guessing that if mom and dad are fighting, you're going to pick up that part too, plus the stress hormones and everything else. My partner at CDC, Dr. Robert Anda, very astutely saw that what we were going to be turning up was going to be very threatening to a lot of people, physicians partly because as a result of that, we don't really know how to behave comfortably or what to do with the information. Or more bluntly, if some have said to me, if I wanted to be a damn shrink, I'd have been a shrink. I'm a pediatric endocrinologist. And partly because it's easier to respond to the manifest symptom of the moment rather than to try to go back in time to see what the underpinnings might have been, particularly, you know, when they're so far back. And, you know, we see going on in our country now with the Me Too movement, that element of bringing something that needs to get out of the shadows out into the open and deal with it head on. And I think that, you know, with adverse childhood experiences and all forms of abuse, how do we get that out of the shadows? How do we take the shame so people are not afraid to be able to tell their story? What we discovered impressively was that, you know, two minutes seemed to have a huge measurable effect. Plus the fact that much of the work that would otherwise be so time consuming face-to-face -face interviewing can be offloaded into an inert mechanism. For us, it was a 10 page medical history questionnaire filled out at home, not on some clipboard in the doctor's waiting room. The 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences that we studied were three of abuse, heavy duty emotional abuse, basically recurrent humiliation, heavy duty physical abuse, you know, serious beating, contact sexual abuse, two categories of neglect, emotional neglect and physical neglect, and five categories of major household dysfunction. And what we found to our total surprise was that simply asking reliably all the time by an inert mechanism initially, well-devised questionnaire, then following that up in the exam room, I see on the questionnaire that, can you tell me how that's affected you later in your life? And listening and implicitly accepting was a very powerful form of doing if we're going to become a trauma-informed healthcare organization and we're going to start going there, there's a need to build that capacity of who are those people that can hear the story. And, you know, we all know physicians have, you know, they have to see lots of patients during the course of the day. And so then you look for those champions. Who are those people that are, you know, that aha moment say, I get this. I want to do some things in pediatrics. And then you realize that there's a lot of people doing a lot of good stuff already. When people are traumatized, they're not here. They're still responding to the past trauma, right? All their behaviors are designed to help them survive it, right? And one of the things I think we got to get out of the habit of is thinking that the way that we help people heal is just people coming to an office. Especially communities of color have to begin to reclaim those healing strategies and teach each other these strategies that will allow us to heal each other, as opposed to say, you gotta go see Rasma, right? And I may not have all of the answers, but maybe me having a settled nervous system, when I'm talking to somebody who has an unsettled nervous system, who is activated, who has experienced trauma, just me being a human being may help them settle just a little bit so they can then ask for help. 
I like to think that I'm culturally knowledgeable, but the more I find out, the more I realize I'm not because I'm white, middle class. I haven't had those experiences. So even as a therapist, you sit there and go, oh yeah, I understand. Well, I don't understand because I haven't had the same experience. I don't have the same background. I don't have the same resiliency, you know, whatever the piece is there. So, you know, shouldn't I be sitting there going, how can I put my knowledge and give it to you so that you can make the changes? Because it's, yeah, it's not me making the changes. And I've always sort of thought I was a, a pretty compassionate person. Um, but the ACE study, I think, really helped me to uh, deepen to a greater level in my compassion, especially with the struggles of, of certain individuals. And, you know, we know from the study that even people, you know, that there's a two to three times higher incidence of cancer and heart disease. And so there's a lot of ailments that we uh, encounter here at, at St. Cloud Hospital in which ACEs may be part of that story. And so recognizing that, you know, that journey is a lot harder for certain individuals. If you have had a start in life that involved some of these significant adverse childhood experiences, that your journey to health, your journey to wholeness, your journey to well-being is a harder journey. These play out in multiple different ways in various disease states that chronic major unrelieved stress can as one of its outcomes lead to biomedical disease, not as a result of coping mechanisms, you know, like smoking two packs a day and so forth, but as a result of complex physiologic processes emanating out of one's brain and various control systems in the brain affecting various organ systems in one's body. For instance, under conditions of chronic major unrelieved stress, one of the things that can happen is suppression of one's immune system. We all are forming cancer cells every day at a low level. Our immune systems recognize them, destroy them, we're never the wiser. Getting cancer means either that the rate of production is massively increased above the ability of our immune systems to process them out, or our immune system function is markedly suppressed so it can't even handle the low level of normal production. The American Heart Association just put out a paper on the connection between cardiometabolic issues and ACEs. So stroke, heart attack, any kind of cardiovascular disease, they have done a scientific paper now that says there is a correlation. And we haven't addressed the preventive part. And I think as healthcare people, we react instead of be proactive. And so I think it's really changing how we look at the system instead of saying, oh, we have this patient here. How does that patient fit into the system, whether it be at home, whether it be in their community, whether it be in the hospital? Because I think it's the system that needs to be looked at and changed, not just the individual. I love what CentraCare is doing. And I wish more white folks was trying to do that, right? And I wish it was deeper. And I wish it was more focused on not just trauma once people got here. We need to have those resilient opportunities for children to come and be with bodies that are not as dysregulated, but these types of interventions are not enough and they're not deep enough. The magnitude of the problem is so enormous and treatment approaches are so difficult and costly that you know you can spend your rest of your life becoming the next Mother Teresa or Albert Schweitzer and you'll be so busy helping people that you'll never notice you're just nibbling at the edges of the problem, leaving the vast bulk unrecognized and untouched. So if anything meaningful is going to come out of this, it's going to be coming out of what we would call primary prevention, preventing it from happening in the first place. Now, no one knows how to do this, but it's the right problem to focus on. The cost to the healthcare system is pretty profound. Um, when we talk about it in real dollars, those are kids who are admitted. Those are kids who seek care multiple times for a singular problem. Someone who, whose parents might be alcoholics the role that it plays for that child growing up and developing, and now what's their capability of really just being a constructive person in the workforce day to day, that's impaired. 
So the cost to society, whether it's, you know, on one extreme of, you know, prison or anything else versus just day to day, it, who knows what we could be if we could focus on some of these issues up front. Children learn not only from what you say, but they learn from what you do. They may have learned what they need to learn in terms of whether or not the world is a safe place or the world is a dangerous place from being inside your womb. Or they may have learned it from what got turned on and turned off in dad's sperm. That's the epigenetic pieces. And so in terms of healing, it really is about how do you help people understand that their bodies matter. One of the ways that they help their children deal with the trauma is that they help themselves deal with the trauma first because then that kind of recalibrates their nervous system, recalibrates their system. So the vibratory stuff that's coming off that the children are picking up on is more balanced and more resourced. Um, and we don't talk about it like that. We talk about it, what can I tell you so you're not traumatized? In those situations where kids have experienced ongoing stress, there are still elements in which kids have that internal ability to survive. And so learning about what some of those pieces are, fostering some of those executive functions very early on so that the very basic elements to that are when things don't go your way, how do you navigate yourself out of it and rebound? And when a community is healthy, you have this pendulation that goes back and forth. When I'm having a very difficult time and I can't access my own resilience, I can tap into my people's resilience, right? I can tap into other things. But when a community has been ripped apart and torn asunder, it's really hard for us to tap into that resilience in community because it's been undermined, language has been stripped away. Worldview has been stripped away. Understanding about your place has been stripped away. Institutional apparatuses have been stripped away. Intergenerational pass downs have been stripped away, right? So what we have to do is actually create and help people create and reclaim those pieces that have been systematically and purposely destroyed. That helps the individual be able to actually tap into their own resilience and it helps the community and the communal pieces actually shore itself up. For me, it's really identifying the people in those communities that are making a difference. There's some amazing stuff going on in this community. The Promise Neighborhood is one of them. I sat in on one of their Wednesday night Build the Brain sessions, and it's amazing. I mean, it is working, and, and they have the right idea. And I think the more this part of St. Cloud recognizes and integrates that, then this part of St. Cloud will sit there and go, aha, maybe it is okay. We need the power people to make the changes, but we need the thoughts and ideas and what people down in that subculture need to make a difference. That's where the change is gonna be. Really the most important thing for families to know is that they're not alone, um, number one, and Number two, that nobody expects for them to solve it all on their own. That that's what we're here and designed to do together. And it's little steps forward, moving together. And that as much as parenting is supposed to come naturally, it's also, it's the hardest thing there is to do. And it's the hardest thing to feel like you're getting right. So being really open to taking some of that feedback up front and leaning on others who have expertise to really learn how to do that and doing it with your friends and your neighbors and all of everybody together, it's really, it's kind of the fundamentals. When I talk about Centricare's role and the things that we're doing within Centricare to become trauma-informed, we're also vitally engaged with the broader community, the education, you know, the local school district, the university, the Department of Human Services, public health, the police departments, the judicial system. And then of course our healthcare system really working together, collaborating together, using resources together, trying to develop programs and services that as a community 
we are trauma-informed and that we're creating programs and services that can have an impact on this, both in terms of prevention and then helping people to uh, recover and, and, and find healing. And, you know, from a healthcare perspective, I mean, the reality is when you look at the statistics and you see how this impacts our health, that if we can influence that trajectory, it can have a profound impact on people's health, wholeness, well-being, and even the cost of health care. I don't know that we can ever eliminate ACEs, but if we say we want to decrease the amount of ACEs and we really want the next generation to be benefit from healthy parenting, healthy housing and everything else, the only way we can do that is by reaching out into the community and getting their involvement, empowering them to do, do what they need to do. We're the resource people. Take it, do what you do best. Whole People Childhood Trauma is a TPT Partnerships co-production with Centra Care Health. Mm -hmm.